Groups and organizations. What is a social group? A social group is two or more people who identify and interact with one another. They're generally made up of people having shared experiences and loyalties and interests. Um, they think of themselves as a we. Now, not every group of people is a social group. People with a status in common are a category and not a social group. They know that other people hold the same status, but they're likely strangers to each other. So you guys are students and you don't even know all the students here at Fisher, let alone all the college students. And so that would be a status that you share in common as opposed to a social group. Now, our social groups fall into two categories, and that depends on like how connected we are to the people in the group. So a primary group is a small social group with personal enduring relationships. These are the first groups we experience in life. They're unique. They're irreplaceable. They're bound by loyalty and emotion. Spend a lot of time together and know each other pretty well. And they display what's called personal orientation. They define themselves in terms of who they are. Secondary group is a large and personal group whose members pursue a specific goal or activity. Uh, they have weaker emotional ties. They might not have much personal knowledge of, that was weird, sorry, much personal knowledge of each other and exist for a short time. They don't think of themselves as a we and they display goal orientation. They define themselves in terms of what they are, what they do for each other, and they're more formal and polite. Now, most real groups contain elements of both. Things don't always neatly fall into only one category. Now, one thing that's important with groups is leadership, and we have two types of leadership, instrumental and expressive. Instrumental leadership is emphasizing getting things done, okay? The completion of tasks. These folks have formal secondary relationships with each other, and successful instrumental leaders enjoy more respect from other members. Now, expressive leaders are more concerned with collective well-being, raising morale, minimizing tensions, they cultivate more primary ties, and successful expressive leaders have more personal affection from group members. Now in a traditional, emphasis on traditional, North American family, we have both types. A more traditional dad role is more instrumental. Dad might make some decisions, dad might earn income, and mom might be more expressive. She's more concerned with supportive and peaceful relationships between family members. Today, though, most people assume both leadership roles, men and women, doesn't really fall along these neat gender lines. We can also characterize leadership in terms of how they make decisions. So authoritarian leaders focus on those instrumental concerns. They take personal charge of decision making and they demand strict compliance from those below them. Democratic styles are more expressive. They include everyone in the decision making process. And laissez-faire styles allow the group to function more or less on its own. Now, one thing to think about with groups is group conformity. So Ash did this experiment where he shows re, uh, respondents, research participants, lines, okay? And he shows them, like, the line on card one and the line on card two, right? And the point of the experiment is that at some point, someone in the room is going to say A is not the same as card one. They're going to say B is or C is. And they look to see, do other people in the group start conforming to the other answer? So if I say C, are you like, oh, crap, I got this wrong. And now you say C, right? And that's group conformity. Milgram did research on punishment, and um, he came to the conclusion that people are likely to follow the lead of not only legitimate authority figures, but also groups of regular people, even when it means harming another person. So Milgram did an experiment where there's people in another room, and um, the research subject is um, told that they have to provide a shock 
to a person who answers a question incorrectly. Now, nobody's actually getting shocked, but the research participants think somebody is. And the person in the other room makes noise as though they're being um, actually shocked. If the research participant questions whether or not they should shock the person, they're simply told by the researcher, the experiment must continue. And it's surprising how many people are willing to shock somebody. Janice looked at research on group think, which is the tendency of group members to conform, meaning we get a really narrow view of some issue. It, it's common to think like, oh, if we get a group of people together, a group of experts, right, we can come to the best possible answer or best possible solution. But sometimes the group starts to all navigate towards the same place, the same narrow view. Now, another type of group is a reference group. How do we assess our attitudes and beliefs? One way we do that is using a reference group, and that's a social group that serves as a point of reference and helping us make evaluations and decisions. You might think you're a renegade, you might think you're super individualistic, but we have a very strong need as human beings to conform, and that means other people's attitudes and opinions affect us greatly. And so we use groups that we don't belong to for references. Remember, we talked about this um, in chapter three when we talked about anticipatory socialization. So Stouffer does this study asking um, soldiers what they think their odds are of advancement, of being promoted. Okay, And you might think the people that are in a unit that has a high promotion rate would think like, cool, I'm probably going to get promoted. A lot of people get promoted in this unit. But the opposite is true. People in units with low promotion rates were more optimistic. Now, we don't make judgments about ourselves in a vacuum, and we don't compare ourselves with just any old person, right? If we're comparing ourselves as to whether or not we're smart or athletic or talented in some way or kind, we're usually picking specific people to compare ourselves to. And then we form a subjective sense of ourselves and how our well-being is by looking at ourselves compared to the specific reference group. We also have in-groups and out-groups. We all favor some groups more than others. Um, and so an in-group is a social group that commands your esteem and loyalty, and they exist in relation to an out-group. So an in-group, the people in an in-group hold overly positive views of themselves, okay? And an out-group is a, a social group toward which we feel competition or opposition, okay? We might think they're lower status than us. They might be subordinate to us in some way. Well, this isn't always bad, right? Being a member of an in-group um, sharpens our boundaries, gives us clear social identities. But we have to remember that, like, if you're like, oh, I'm part of this group and we're the shit, Right? Um, on one hand, like, sure, that's fun to feel that way, right? But on the other hand, like, maybe we're not. Now, the size of the group plays a really important role in how people interact with each other, right? So imagine you're the first person to arrive at a party. You'll notice that until there's about six people there, everybody's kind of going to remain in the same group talking, right? After that, after the group gets to be about six people, seven people, the group's going to splinter off into smaller clusters, right? The more people there are, the more possible relationships there are. So we have dyads, which are groups of two, triads, which are groups of three, right? And because in a triad, one person can mediate disputes, in some ways it's more stable, but also when there's three people, sometimes they gang, two of them gang up on a third member. As groups get bigger than three, when they lose a member, they're able to stay relatively stable. Now, social diversity influences how groups interact and how people interact within groups as well. So large groups tend to turn inward and members have relationships between themselves. Heterogeneous groups, so diverse groups, um, tend to turn out. And physical boundaries can also create social boundaries. Now, a network is your is a web of weak social ties. Now, depending on what your major is, like if you're a business major and you go into business, you might talk a lot about like your social network or your business network, right? 
that's a web of social ties that you have. A lot of people can use their networks to try to connect with jobs and internships, right? It acts as a form of social capital. And people who are very privileged and networks full of privileged people are very valuable. Those people can make a lot of connections for you and be a very powerful resource. Now, our networks are based on lots of different things. They're based on colleges. There's some alums at some types of colleges where they're very um, interconnected with each other, okay? Alumni networks can be super powerful. It could be through a club, your neighborhood, political party, personal interests you have. The biggest, most extensive social networks are young, well-educated people living in large cities. Women have more relatives in their network. Men include more coworkers. And new technology has allowed us to network in ways that are completely different, right? So LinkedIn exists today. And in some fields, LinkedIn gets used extensively. People post on LinkedIn a lot. People network and do business on LinkedIn a lot. Now, in my field, criminology, I think all of us are on LinkedIn. Not all of us, like I know all the criminologists in the world. But I know I rarely check it. In fact, it probably hasn't been updated in years. Now, along with networking, we have social media, right? We've talked about social media a couple times. It's a media that allows us to communicate with one another, share information, form communities. So by 2011, 600 million people were involved in Facebook. Uh, I know Facebook is not popular with your generation, but it started with college students. And initially it was sort of like, I'm going to say an elite thing, right? But it was only certain colleges, Okay, so it started at Harvard, then it was a couple other Boston colleges, and so many people weren't on it, okay? And it sort of made people be like, oh, what's going on on that Facebook, right? By the end of 2021, though, 3 billion people are on there. Probably, you probably think of this as like old people's social networking. Facebook, Twitter, I guess now called X, other social networking sites, right? TikTok, these are ways for people to connect with each other. Now, our group life and our social life suffered during COVID, right? We had a lot of social isolation, actual physical isolation. Um, and certainly in the early stages of the pandemic, when we don't even know how safe it is to be around other people, um, our, our group life is seriously weakened, right? Lockdowns reduced direct social contact. And that meant virtual groups became more important, right? I think everybody got on Zoom during the pandemic, Right. And people would have like a Zoom with their family. You have a Zoom with some of your friends. You get together, kind of like chat. Maybe you had dinner over Zoom with people. Right. So ways of connecting uh, using technology became more important. Now, within groups, we have formal organizations. These are large secondary groups organized to achieve a goal efficiently. Right. So that could be like uh, part of your government. It could be your school. They're usually more impersonal, more formal than small social groups. Now, they can be utilitarian in nature. It's a group you join to make a living, right? So you join the police force. You join, I don't know, a social work organization, right? You're joining that to make a living and support yourself. Some are normative. They're pursuing some goal that's considered morally worthwhile. This is very prevalent here in our country. A lot of people um, have a cause they might volunteer for. I volunteered with the Rape Crisis Center here in Boston for six years. A lot of people who volunteer in, in groups that are very meaningful like that to them will volunteer for a long period of time. And then there's coercive ones, ones you did not want to be part of. Prison, psych hospital, they have special features, locked doors, you're supervised by security. The goal is to radically alter your attitude and belief. <clears throat> now, just like anything else that we categorize, people don't fall neatly and organizations don't fall neatly into these groups. Some groups may have elements of both, right? So you could be part of a utilitarian group. You joined a group to make a living, right? But it might also really pursue goals that are morally worthwhile. And sometimes the group you join to make a living definitely feels like it's coercive. Okay, 
So large groups, right, large formal organizations are often bureaucracies. They develop because early organizations were not very efficient. And the point of a bureaucracy is it's supposed to make things efficient, even though it often doesn't. We didn't have technology to travel long distances, to communicate quickly, to collect and store information. And so pre-industrial societies had very traditional characters. Sentiments and beliefs got passed on from one generation to the next. And this keeps a society or a culture very conservative. Now, our modern worldview is one of rationality. We're deliberate, matter-of-fact calculations. We're looking for the most efficient way to accomplish those tasks, right? You probably are familiar with the saying, work smarter, not harder, right? Like, what's the, you know, easiest, most efficient way I can accomplish something? And so the rise of the organization really rests on this idea of rationalism. And so a bureaucracy is an organizational model that is designed to perform tasks efficiently, and it has six elements. One is that it specializes in something, right? So we don't go to one government office to have all our government stuff taken care of. Like when you want to get your permit, when you want to get your driver's license, you got to renew it, you got to register your car. There's a specific place you go to. You go to the registry, right? You go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that's all they deal with there. Can't get your social security card there. Can't get food stamps there. There's a hierarchy of offices, lots of rules and regulations, some technical competence is required. It's very impersonal and a lot of formal written communication. Now, how well and efficiently an organization runs depends on things that are outside that organization too, right? Like what kind of technology is available? What's going on in the economy or the political environment? What's going on with your population, right? So like, are we at a time or a, a place where like our population of young people is very low or is it very high? What are current events? Other organizations affect your organization? Now, an ideal bureaucracy should regulate every activity, but people are pretty stubborn, right? And they resist this. And so that might mean that people cut corners, Um Sometimes that's a good thing. People are cutting corners. It's providing some necessary flexibility, right? Like sometimes bureaucracies are really bogged down in rules that don't always make sense. Some of this informality comes um, based on the varying styles of leaders, right? So things like what are the qualities of your leaders? How much charisma do they have? What are their quirks? That affects outcomes. And sometimes people seek to benefit personally by abusing their power, right? Sometimes leaders take credit for their subordinates' work. Um, hopefully you guys have not been in jobs where this has happened to you yet, but it will happen to you in the future. You might suggest something, and then someone else suggests it, and all of a sudden people are like, wow, Mike had a great idea. And you're like, oh, Mike had a great idea? Okay, great. Communication also has an informal side, right? So as much as there's all this written formal communication, there's a lot of grapevine gossip through your different networks. And email has also made it much easier for people to bypass the chain of commands, right? And just jump right up the food chain to someone else to try to get their problem resolved. So how come bureaucracies have developed this informality? Well, some of that depends on the personality of the leaders there, right? Like some leaders really want to micromanage. Some leaders are very hands-off. Um, what types of communication are there? What kind of technology is available? Now, bureaucracies have lots of problems too, right? So because they often have these like rules and those are the rules and they've always been the rules, they often end up being like very inefficient, right? So like you might have heard people talk about like, oh, there's a lot of red tape for that, right? It's hoops you have to jump through to get something done. Um, Bureaucracy also has the potential to really dehumanize the people it's supposed to serve. You don't, you go to the DMV, it's not an experience of like, oh, you know these people and they're really there to help you. A lot of people who work in a bureaucracy, right, there's little reason to work efficiently, every reason to want to protect their job. And a lot of times they end up looking like oligarchies, which is a rule of many by just a few. So that hierarchical nature puts a few people in charge of many people, and people might use their access to information to promote their own self-interest.
So bureaucracy is a top-down model, right? And this develops because a lot of businesses were inefficient, um, or rather, a lot of businesses remain inefficient. <clears throat> so to increase efficiency, um, Taylor argues we should apply some scientific principles, right? And this scientific approach to management has three steps. One, you should carefully observe the tasks performed by each employee, right? You should identify all the operations, measure the time needed for each of them. <clears throat> you guys might one day find yourself in a job where the people in HR want you to detail like how you spend all of your time. The next thing they're gonna do is analyze that data, figure out how can you perform these tasks more efficiently, and the management would provide guidance and incentives for you to do it more efficiently. And in the early 1900s, a lot of companies followed this, but new challenges start to arise. There's changes in the nature of work, competition from abroad, things like gender and race start to play an impact here. And a recent trend with efficiency is outsourcing, right? This is when people contract some parts of their business with other organizations, right? Things that used to be done in-house. So <clears throat> we think of Apple as an American company, right? But a lot of the parts for iPhones and MacBooks um, are made overseas and then maybe assembled here in the U.S. And so outsourcing saves money because we can outsource jobs to countries where we can pay people way less then you have to pay people here in this country. Um, but it also has a lot of consequences, right? So you have to sit and think about how you feel about that. Think about a company like Timu or Sheen, right? There's a reason those companies and their products are so inexpensive, right? First of all, they're cheaply made. They're not made with quality products, right? And quality materials. But they're also made in places where you pay people pennies on the dollar, Okay, so one challenge to groups, formal organizations, bureaucracy, is diversity and inclusion, right? So for a long time, there's patterns of exclusion. Rather than hiring people and promoting them based on merit, people routinely excluded women and minorities. Um, you know, 100 years ago, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a sign in, like, a, a business that said, like, Irish need not apply. This ignores talents of many people in the population, right? Um <clears throat> Now, the female advantage is the idea that some people think women bring specialized management skills, right? And that um, women are more open to asking questions, right? They don't have as many or as much resistance to admitting when they don't know something, right? <clears throat> so one study found some gender-linked patterns, found that women place greater value on communication and share more information than men. Women are more flexible leaders. They tend to be less micromanaging, give more autonomy to those below them. And they often emphasize how different parts of the organization are interconnected. Now, a second challenge for organizations is global competition, right? So, you know, a lot of things are made overseas because it's expensive to make them here in the United States. Right, so like automobile manufacturing became a global business. And that means that US companies start facing intense competition from abroad. Some of the reasons for this are, you know, how the economy is developing in other parts of the country, um, cultural patterns, and breakthroughs in technology. Hey, look at that, we got the same slide twice, huh? Or did I skip a slide? Yep, same slide twice. Woo! We get that one done. Okay, so for example, Japanese organizations, right? They reflect the culture in Japan. Remember I told you that Japan's like 95% ethnic Japanese, right? So very homogenous culture, okay? And there's some differences between their organizations and ours. So in the U.S., promotions and salaries are handed out like prizes. And in Japan, new school grads are hired together at the same salary and the same responsibility, Japan hires workers for life and fosters strong loyalty, uh, and they avoid layoffs by restraining workers for new retraining workers for new positions. So, like maybe your position's becoming obsolete because of some new technology, they train you for a new job. In Japan, they have more holistic involvement. Your company might help you get a mortgage, sponsor recreational activities, and that strengthens collective identity. 
In the U.S., we're highly specialized in terms of our training. And in Japan, you get trained in all phases of a company's operations. And in Japan, there's also more collective decision making. Workers are involved in quality circles to discuss decisions that affect them. There's also smaller salary differences between executives and workers. And this means in Japan, people have more loyalty to the companies they work for. Now, a third challenge here is that the nature of work has changed. Most people are using computers and other electronic technology to process information. Okay, so today's organizations are very different from those a century ago. So we have less day to day supervision, generally, as long as we're generating good ideas. Um, a lot of uh, jobs are encouraging competitive work teams, giving several groups of employees the freedom to work on a problem. It's more of a flat organization as opposed to like a strict hierarchy and greater flexibility. Now, this is not true of everywhere. Please don't look at this list and be like, dang, when I finish my bachelor's degree, I'm going to get a job that's going to be delicious and delightful. Some places are still very rigid. All right. Now, when you think about McDonald's, what do you think about? McDonald's is fast and efficient. If I get a hamburger at one McDonald's, it's going to be the same as at another McDonald's, right? You know exactly what to expect. You know you're not going in there for a really like quality ground beef hamburger, okay? And a lot of aspects of life are being modeled on this chain. Like how efficient can we be? We have a tendency in this country to think that if we can do something quickly, that's good enough reason. Calculability, right? McDonald's, things are mass produced uniformly. All the burgers weigh the same. They're all the same size. Uniformity and predictability. It's a highly rational system that specifies everything and nothing is left to chance. And a lot of control through automation, right? So we're automating equipment to minimize human error. Now, rational systems are efficient, right? McDonald's can process a lot of meals and do it quickly, right? And uh, cheaply, right? But that doesn't mean that's better. And it's often dehumanizing. Now, how did the pandemic affect organizations, right? Lockdowns were really hard. Um, you guys probably remember in the early days of the pandemic, right? Restaurants are closed. Um, a lot of people are losing, you know, income. They don't have paid time off. They don't have sick time. If you work for a small business, your bit, that business might not be able to pay you while it's closed, right? And so a lot of small businesses failed and a lot of them failed quickly. But some businesses made bank things like Amazon, right? Even though you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere, Amazon was making bank, right? And the cost of things like Lysol wipes went through the roof because they were hard to get your hands on, right? Other thing that happened is the power of the government expanded, right? So never in our lifetimes before have we been somewhere where borders were closed. Everybody had to wear masks. We shut down businesses, right? Uh, a lot of places had curfews where unless you were going to or from work, you couldn't be out past a certain hour, right? When you went to work, if you did go to work, you were wearing a mask. You, uh, When we came back to work at Fisher, we were being tested, and students were as well. We were being um, COVID tested at one point twice a week and another point once a week, right? So we had to be tested, So what's the future for organizations? Well, we see a lot of different trends, right? So we're in a post-industrial economy and that's created a lot of highly skilled jobs, but it also creates a lot more routine service jobs. So one in eight people have worked at McDonald's at one point or another, right? There's a really large and personal social network. Flexible organizations give better, um, that gives better off workers more autonomy, can threaten downsizing to the rank and file. And some organizations facing global t competition are eager to cut costs by eliminating as many routine jobs as possible.